were directed against the sovereignty of its uh, neighbors. You know, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Crimea, Lugansk, Donetsk, and now it's a waging war against the Ukraine, threatening and questioning the right of sovereign Ukraine to exist. And this is the war not for the Ukrainian independence or for the Ukrainian state, but we believe that it's a war for our future, for what kind of world are we going to live in. And Ukraine is on the front line of this uh, struggle for the world where countries cannot just pick up other territories as they wish. And I believe that Ukraine is fighting not only for themselves, but you know, for us, and I'm repeating myself, because you know, it's quite emotional to sit here and to talk you know, from Georgia about the things which are taking place you know, in, in Ukraine. The world has changed during these nine days, and we have you know, found ourselves in a completely different circumstances. And it's kind of, it's a moment of truth. One cannot be in the middle, it's either dark or bright. And uh, everyone has to make a choice depending on its values and its beliefs. And I deeply believe that choice of a Georgian people is on a bright side, uh, consolidated in support of uh, Ukraine. The whole substance of the Russian, um, you know, Putin's empire, let's say like this, lies on the, is based on the lies and disinformation, manipulation with information, pseudo information as, uh, you know, uh, Fiona Hill labeled it. And uh, this yesterday's, for example, the address was also a manifestation of that. Unfortunately, the disinformation efforts have been increasing and becoming more active and aggressive in the whole world, what we observe, but in Georgia uh, as well. There are the attempts to strengthen the Russian narratives and to, um, to question the Western solidarity, which was unprecedented, uh, as well as uh, validity and uh, efficacy of the, um, of the sanctions. The, those events have shown um, you know, really unprecedented Western solidarity that we observe. But this is not only of the Russian aggression, but this is also because of the heroism that the Ukrainian people have demonstrated uh, in this unjust war. Um, unfortunately, purposely or unintentionally, many representing different segments of society are expressing statements or supporting statements which are part of those narratives. And um, I think that the purpose of today's meeting is exactly to, you know, to give out the information, to talk openly what the West, the consolidated West, is um, you know, doing in order to deter the Russian aggression. Um, it's, a, it's a decisive moment. And uh, the outcome of this conflict will decide in what kind of world we will live in and what, what will be, you know, international affairs look like and it will definitely have a huge effect on our you know, country, on Georgia. Um, but the heroism of Ukrainian people and the solidarity expressed by the Western countries and whole civilized world gives a hope that the right cause will win. And here are uh, representatives of those nations, of those states who took the leadership and demonstrated that, uh, you know, so important um, solidarity that, you know, the world needs right now. And let me welcome U.S. Ambassador um, Kelly Degnan, um, Ambassador of Republic of Turkey to Georgia, Fatma Cer and Yazgan, Ambassador of Poland to Georgia, Mr. Um, Mshkevich, and also Andrea Kalindra, Lithuanian Ambassador to Georgia. But before actually switching to, you know, <clears throat> to our distinguished speakers and um, to share with us the positions of their countries as well as, you know, the steps forward. Um, I would like to also thank everyone who represent that consolidate civilized world, who is not maybe represented here, but is in the audience, or you know, not even here, but you know, is doing you know, the right cause. And with this, I would like to give a floor to you, know, you Dre, for giving us the you know, update about the recent developments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miseka, for your emotional. Uh, address. 
for your continuous support of those who are right now on the front line defending the European values. Uh, dear colleagues, distinguished panelists, uh, let me start by, by saying that we are meeting with you at a time when Ukraine is at war, when every day our people, children, sons and daughters and our soldiers are dying every day. Let me be clear with you, uh, the content of the war is for Europe. We are dying for Europe, for European values, for standards. Today, as you know, that Russia committed an act of nuclear terrorism. The largest nuclear power plant in Europe, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, was hit by Russia. There is a threat of the worldwide nuclear catastrophe. Uh, last night, the President of Ukraine, Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, signed 15 decrees on awarding Ukrainian citizens as the heroes of Ukraine. The list are two from exhaustive. The war continues. Civilians and children continue to die. The aggressor state continues to cynically shell leave neighborhoods, civilian and homes, schools, kindergartens, maternity, 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 hospitals, and other critical infrastructure places in almost every cities and villages of Ukraine. Missile and bombing prohibited by the international humanitarian law continues to be directed to the critical infrastructure facilities, including railway stations, at a time when civilians or children are being evacuated. All these actions are classified as war crimes. The President of Ukraine, Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, stressed Russia will bear international legal responsibility for war crimes. You know that Ukraine has already filed a lawsuit to the ICJ, and the first hearings in the case uh, Ukraine against Russia will take place on March 7th, 8th in The Hague. Additionally, the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court opened an investigation into events into Ukraine alleged war crimes, genocide, and humanity. Meanwhile, the heroic armed forces of Ukraine are doing the impossible to protect Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. The territorial defense forces of the armed forces of Ukraine are demonstrated miracles. 40 million nations is mobilized and is re ready to knock out the enemy from the Ukrainian soil and land. According to the latest statistical poll, 93% of the Ukrainian citizens are convinced that Ukraine will defeat Russia. The figure clearly demonstrates how great today is the patriotic and liberty spirit of the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian forces. The war continues on the diplomatic front. UN, where Ukraine is confidently, confidently winning. The UN General Assembly resolutions aggression against Ukraine was recently adopted and supported by 141 countries. Only five countries, and you know who is that, Russia, Syria, North Korea, Belarus, and Eritrea voted against. This is exactly what Russia's loneliness means. This is what the anti-war coalition stands. The resolution contains a number of important elements, namely the recognition of the Russia's aggression, concrete demands for Russia to withdraw troops from Ukraine beyond its internationally recognized borders, including the Crimea and separate regions of Lugansk and Donetsk, Oblast. The resolution is considered not only the important political document which is fixing the Russian aggression, but the document which will be further used by Ukraine in relevant international courts. Uh, Ukraine welcomes the EU Parliament resolution on granting Ukraine as a EU candidate status. It is clear uh, uh, manifestation of solidarity and moral support of Ukraine for the part of the EU. We call on all governments of the EU member states to ensure the implementation of this decision with a view to secure the, the Ukraine's full membership in the EU as soon as possible. 
It is very important to continue the sanctions pressure on Russia. We know that the Russian economy is almost suspended and exhausted. Therefore, we call on the international partners to put further pressure on Russia to bring its economic and financial system to complete, irreversible and total collapse. It is extremely important that the partners impose all possible sanctions against the Russian banking sector to close seaports, to stop imports of Russian oil and gas, close airspace for Russian operators. However, we know that many of the EU and US, many states have already done so. Disconnect Russia from the SWIFT. We request and we call on all partners to apply the similar sanctions on Belarus immediately. International assistance should, as a matter of priority, focus on providing Ukraine with the maximum amount of military and military technical support. Ukraine is ready to protect all European countries, but to do so, we need to have the necessary arsenal of military means and capabilities. It is important to provide Ukraine with fighters, with a modern system and means of air defense as soon as possible to fight and defeat enemy's air targets. Just today, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Mr. Dmitry Kuleba, said that stingers are nice, but it's not enough. We need much more strong capabilities to protect our skies. We also urge NATO member states to close the sky of Ukraine immediately by introducing no-fly zone, so-called A2 slash AD zone. According to the President of Ukraine, this decision, and I quote, will help us a lot and it will not involve NATO member states in the war. Three dots. And to be honest, everyone has been involved in the war for a long time and obviously not by Ukraine. End of the quote. Dear colleagues, dear friends, now we emphasize the importance of providing international support to Ukraine on hosting of refugees, which the United Nations estimated is already over 1 million. We ask all international partners to redouble their efforts to assist in the reception of refugees and eternally displaced persons that suffered from the Russian war. Humanitarian assistance, that is an important area for cooperation. I would like to know here that now Poland has become a hub for humanitarian aid to the Ukrainian population. Uh, we are very grateful to our Polish friends for such step of solidarity and support for them. We will never forget that. We also would like to thank here to all international partners, to all friends, to the Georgian side, to the Georgian business community, to all the citizens of Ukraine around the whole world who are helping to provide us with the humanitarian assistance. That's what we need to do now. That's what we need to do together. I would like to conclude my statement with the words of the President of Ukraine, High Commander-in-Chief of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, Mr. Vladimir Zelensky, and I quote, Today, Ukrainians are the symbol of invincibility. A symbol that people in any country in the world can be the best people on earth at any time. Glory to Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Mr. Cassiano. Um, and now let me switch um, to Ambassador, U.S. Ambassador to Georgia, um, uh, Ambassador Degnan. Thank you, first of all, for being with us. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot have been said, and it's completely open. Uh, 
floor to you know talk about your position, your countries, you know what has been done and what steps would be taken. But my question is uh, that uh, you know Russia has been. Um, carrying out this aggression since the very fall of the Soviet Union against its neighbors, against its own people. And now it's waging this major you know, war and aggression. Do you think that what has been done now uh, will uh, be a high cost? So will, will, that, um, is, is, will Russia pay a cost for these actions in order to preclude the further aggression? Thank you. Thank you, Eka, and I would just want to say at the start, uh, thank you for holding this event. It's, as usual, Rondelli Foundation has organized something that is extremely timely and gives us all a chance to come together uh, and talk about the most important issue of the day. I'd also like to thank our Ukrainian colleague for a very powerful speech um, that is a reminder of just how personal uh, this is at, in terms of touching so many people's lives at a very um, existential level, uh, but also touching all of our lives at the level of um, preserving our way of life, which has uh, been put at risk by this unprovoked and unpremeditated um, assault uh, and aggression by, by Russia. Um, your question is a good one, uh, Eka. I, I think Russia is already paying a dear cost um, in terms of seeing just how united the world is against this kind of aggression. Un again, unprovoked, unpremeditated aggression that violates the fundamental principles that have brought economic growth and uh, prosperity and a certain amount of stability to, um, to the European, the Euro-Atlantic region. Uh, to put that at risk for um, the paranoid delusions is uh, is just appalling and uh, very difficult to grasp. Um, I, I know that we we've seen a wave of responses, and uh, I. I, th I thought it was worth kind of summarizing them in a sense to, to show just how much has been um, brought to bear by the, against Russia by this decision. Um, despite a coordinated and I think very um, intense diplomatic effort to persuade uh, Mr. Putin to de-escalate and to, um, to, to put aside these plans, uh, he went ahead. Um, and as a result, we have seen the unification of uh, Europe, the transatlantic community, um, partners like um, uh, Canada, Japan, Austra Australia, New Zealand, uh, coming together um, to, to say no. No, we are not going to allow another state to invade its neighbor by force. We're not going to take away the fundamental principle that every nation is, has the, the right to choose its security partners um, and uh, other principles that, as I said, have been so fundamental for really 70 years um, and in, in the larger scale, the, the last 30 years. Um, the sanctions that uh, have impose these costs on Russia, uh, I think we see the coordination done during the diplomatic phase in order to give real uh, meaning to our warning to Mr. Putin to not take that step. Um, rolled out then uh, in, in, in waves once he decided to pursue um, force and aggression. Um, and these are uh, expansive economic measures that target nearly 80% of the banking assets in Russia, sanctions on two largest financial institutions and the Russian Direct Investment Fund, cutting off avenues for um, sanctions evasion by the Central Bank of the Russian Federation, which is extremely important to Russia's ability to access its um, reserves. Um, and then, of course, the movement to uh, ensure that key Russian banks are removed from the SWIFT messaging system. Uh, comprehensive sanctions on Russian sovereign debt uh, so that Russia can't raise money in the West or trade its debt in Western markets. 
restricting Russia's largest state-owned enterprises from raising money in the US or with European investors, um, expanding the, the list of um, Russian elites and their family members who are subject to sanctions, including President Putin and uh, Minister Lavrov. Um, on last Tuesday, President Biden announced additional measures um, that the U.S. is imposing to hold Belarus accountable for its part in the invasion. Um, these measures will weaken the Russian defense sector and its military power for years to come, targeting Russia's most important sources of wealth and, as Eka mentioned, uh, banning the Russian airlines from U.S. airspace. Um, these uh, sweeping sanctions and restrictions on Belarus choke off its important its import of technological goods, and we're extending the stringent export control policies that are put in place for Russia to Belarus as a result of its uh, support for Russia's aggression. We are also imposing sweeping sanctions that target Russia's defense sector to further restrict Putin's war machine. This will impact 22 Russian defense-related entities that will be designated on the sanctions list. Um, of course, export controls on oil and gas extraction equipment, um, restrictions on technology exports that uh, uh, support Russia's refining capacity over the long term will also have an important cost for Russia. Um, while we don't see a strategic interest for the United States and our allies and partners in reducing the global supply of energy, which we all need and rely on to keep our economies um, functioning, we have, um, uh, we have a long and strong interest in degrading Russia's status as a leading energy supplier over time, and I think that that has been very consistent in U.S. policy for at least the last decade in trying to increase um, Europe's energy security and reduce its dependence on, on Russia, as well as Georgia's. And uh, right now, all I can say is thank goodness for the Baku Tbilisi Chehan pi pipeline. That was um, a really important uh, infrastructure project here that has given Georgia a lot more um, latitude and Russia a lot less leverage over Georgia. We are also adding entities uh, that support R Russian and Belarusian security services, military and defense sectors, and military and defense research and development efforts to the United States entity list. And as I mentioned, the United States is closing off American airspace to all Russian flights. This includes aircraft certified, operated, registered, or controlled by any person connected with Russia. The, the intent here uh, is to degrade Russia's industrial capacity, high-tech imports, and its military and aerospace industry. They're intended to impact President Putin's long-term strategic ambitions. The idea of sanctions is to influence behavior. It's to change the uh, calculus for Mr. Putin to see that the costs are not worth um, whatever benefits he, is, uh, he intends by his aggressive acts. And the United States is prepared to do more if necessary. We hope that what we are putting in place where, with our allies and partners will be sufficient to dissuade him along with the um, assistance, military assistance that we're providing um, and humanitarian assistance. We've, we've pledged uh, $54 million in humanitarian assistance um, and a uh, billion dollars in security assistance to Ukraine. Um, I, I think we've all seen the work in the multilateral forum, the UN, the OSCE, the NATO, um, and then of course what our countries are doing bilaterally. It's very important and I think very encouraging how well we are sharing information, how well we are coordinating on the actions that we're taking to send a unified message that we are as determined as never before. Um, and the source of our strength continues to be the power, the resilience, and as we see here, the universal appeal of our shared democratic values that have brought us so much stability and prosperity uh, to all of our countries over the past 30 years. 
As my colleague said, this is about more than Ukraine. This is about more than Russia. It's about standing up for what we believe in, for the future that we want for our world, for liberty, for the right of countless countries to choose their own destiny, and the right of people to determine their own futures. This is truly about preserving our way of life, and that is why uh, all our, of our countries and, and my country um, are determined to send a strong, clear message of unity. That is something that I hope that all of our countries will be able to, to project uh, at this critical moment. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Indeed, this decisive response and the solidarity and the leadership, um, you know, is important. And and this this ongoing crisis has shown the importance of uh, you know leaders in, during the political crisis. Um, thank you, um, uh, Jaren. If I may, you know, Ambassador, um, to turn to you. You know, we we know, uh, and it openly has been stated that Turkey does not want to join the sanctions, but despite that, it continues significant support to Ukraine and provides the combat UAVs. And you know, on Telegram channel, I've watched how the Ukrainian soldiers have composed the song even about the Bayraktar. So it's really appreciated and you know, it means a lot. Also, President Zelensky yesterday at the press conference spoke very highly and appreciated, you know, all support and you know, the, uh, from President Erdogan, so, um, you know, especially, he singled out. Can you um, share with us the you know Turkish position in this crisis and what the further steps Turkey is going? Sure. To Thank you very much. Let me join um, in my welcoming uh, remarks to. Uh, uh, friend Canciano, and, and I think we will remember each other from many other uh, days in Kiev as well. Um, and I would like to go back to my days in Kiev, um, where one day uh, the US ambassador asked what will be the Turkish position to take the Ukrainian Kolchugas to Iraq. Uh, it was the day of the parliament's voting in Turkey. And the parliament voted against. The Parliament of Turkey voted against in 2003 because the, the Turkish public opinion and the Turkish elite, political military elite, thought that occupation of Iraq was not a correct idea. And we being a very loyal ally in NATO and a friend of the United States, we warned that uh, time government of United States against this operation. It was on the basis of what we thought uh, for stability, for peace in our region, and for the best interest of our allies. Our ally was very angry with us for many years. Um, but then uh, I think we were proven right. Now, the same thing happens. Russia is a partner of Turkey, and we have cooperation with Russia, and we're telling the same thing. What Russia does today, occupying Ukraine, a sovereign country, infringing its territorial integrity, and disrupting the rule-based international order, is wrong. It is wrong for the region, wrong for the people of this region who have suffered from wars, instability, from poverty, from revolutions. It's wrong for Russia and for the world peace. Russia is a P5 member in United Nations Security Council. It has additional responsibility for keeping peace and order in the world. And indeed, because the United Nations Security Council couldn't decide, the General Assembly, 70 years later, they had to, sorry, 40 years later, they had to do another voting. And 141 countries voted 
that aggression on Ukraine is wrong. And so we, it's not about being bright or dark. I, I am less dramatic and more realistic about how we defined. It's about our collective interest. The world is, the globe is a very small place. And security is indivisible. The governments who take decisions today, which they think will help their power, their own countries, they actually make big mistakes in the midterm, not even the long term. In the long term, as Churchill says, we are all dead. But in the midterm, we owe to our next generations a place where they can prosper together, not on the cost of each other because it doesn't work. Security is indivisible geographically. Security is indivisible also thematically. So I would say that Turkish stance on Ukraine as it was in 2003 today is of principle. As it was in 2008 when Georgia had to face aggression, its territorial integrity and sovereignty of the countries our neighbors, our partners, our friends, we value, we support, we protect. Now, Turkey is a NATO member. Of course, we move in solidarity with our allies. We discuss within the alliance. We decide within the alliance we are in unity. And we will not let hybrid tactics or fifth column activities to disrupt that activity, that union. And, uh, however, NATO is not part of this conflict. NATO is not a site to this conflict. And we believe diplomacy, still in the time of war, which is a war, what we are seeing today, is still needed, have to be continued. And if we're going to have peace, and we will have peace one day, it will be because of diplomacy not because of supremacy of some military power, because that is an unending story. And therefore, we believe, Turkey believes, that there should be always room for diplomacy, and we should continue our efforts. Now, whether Turkey will be able to deliver that diplomacy by itself, that's debatable, and I don't think we should have um, the obligation we all have the obligation, it's not only Turkey's uh, role. Uh, but also, we are going to benefit, uh, Turkey will benefit from peace, reconstruct peace in the region. Again, of principles, what did we do? We apply the Montreal Treaty by its words. As we had always said, we would. And we do. And, and that I take pride because what we say, we do. What we cannot do, we don't say. It's another uh, thing that we would like to remind everyone that let's be realistic and let's make sure that we do not um, exacerbate this situation because it is on the cost of the people of Ukraine at this point. There are my friends. My, my heart is with Ukraine. Every day I wake up, I call my friends, I send them messages, I check how they are in different parts of Ukraine. I try to reach out to our citizens, where our embassy in Kiev is still in place, in Odessa. They are working out to evacuate more than 5,000 people evacuated, Turkish citizens and more. We also try to help other countries whose diplomatic missions or logistics are not able. So it's a human tragedy in many levels, so we have to cope with the realities on the ground. And, and also, despite all the heavy emotional burden on us, individuals, who are supposed to be advising our governments, politicians, we need to be very cold-minded and hearted at some stage. And it means there will be losses uh, but it should not be on the cost of Ukraine, Ukrainian people. So real politics, yes, I understand the real politics, 
as a diplomat, but I cannot come to terms personally that it should be on the cost of the Ukrainian people, my friends. Turkey had lived through wars around it. Uh, Iran-Iraq war, 1980s. The first Iraqi Gulf operation, Saddam invading Kuwait. Again, we were principally against it, and we did help um, a lot for particularly the people of uh, Iraq, the Kurds in the north, uh, 1991. Then we had the, uh, the second. We had uh, all through 1990s, the Nagorno-Karabakh. We had uh, in Georgia, and then 2008 Georgia. I, I mean, all my gen our generation grew up with this. And we thought at some stage, yes, the world was flat. We were being globalized, and there will be interdependence of economy. And so this sort of violations would not be happening. But it is happening. So we have to come to terms. Syria, the last one, which we have to cope with, we have more than 4 million uh, people under protection in Turkey, Syrians, Iraqis, of all uh, ethnic and religious origins. And I underline this because we believe that that reminder of security is indivisible, humanity is indivis indivisible. There is no superiority of conflicts of one to each other, nor the victims nor the refugees. And Turkey will be ready to help. We are ready to help. We help. Not everything we can talk about in front of the press, we will not, because, again, this is a war. There are real people in danger. But I can tell you, we would like to contain and put out this fire of violence, of tragedy. This will be with Diplomacy, this will be with smart decisions, with restrained action, restrained speech. And it's very important to keep international world united in that 141 countries. They're not all Europeans, geographically. Because this is not about, with due respect, its values are not restricted to any geography. They're universal. Mothers love their children in India, in Pakistan. In Turkey, Lithuania, Poland, the same way. And, and I, while I am European, because I have some Bosnian ancestors, I'm also Circassian. I'm a Turk. And my values are not lesser or more than anybody else. And therefore, I caution uh, that this is not about only Europe. It's about human values, universal values, universal security, because we do face a danger of spreading violence. All of us here in this room are experts in international relations and security. We know how quickly we can get into escalations. So for, we should be wiser, smarter, and luckier than our ancestors 100 years ago. So I am a little emotional on this. Uh, I cannot avoid being emotional. And I try to stay calm and give the best advice to our friends in Georgia from all parts of the society. This is a time to unite. This is a time to put many differences in alliances, in NATO, in EU, between EU and Turkey, between whoever. This is a time to unite within the politics. This is what I say in Twitter for the Turkish people, because the Turkish people are very angry with many allies. And they question whether if Turkey was attacked, it would have been protected, because there were times we weren't. But the reality, our government, being responsible for protecting the whole interest of the country and the region, to be frank, as being the only NATO member who has uh, land border with Georgia and uh, many other uh, issues involved. Ukraine, I mean, uh, Crimea. It all started with Crimea. Today, if this occupation didn't happen, we would have been 
uh, Amina Jabarova here, right? And, and she is the first Crimean Tatar who was elected to a political post in Ukraine. And it took an occupation of Crimea, annexation of Crimea, to realize how important it is for us. So there are many issues involved. I don't want to take more time. Uh, my government is firm, standing against this occupation. It's unlawful. The President Erdogan, my minister, all the commentators uh, are saying this, but uh, saying it is not enough. We have to continue our efforts to end the violence. We have to do everything in, uh, uh, we can to persuade the government of Russia uh, that this is not going to end well for no one. So, thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jaren. Uh, if I may, to pick up on this importance of consolidation of uh, you know, the Georgian society and of this whole you know, civilized world. I put there everyone, you know, Cherkes and Turks and the Americans and you know, Georgians, everyone. There is this crucial time when we all need to stand together and be stronger in order to step the, to, st to stop what is um, going on. But I know that Ambassador Mashkevich has to, you know, run kind of earlier. So sorry for you know uh, taking longer. Okay, so um, Ambassador, you know. Poland is one of the most active supporters of Ukraine, and you are neighboring, you know, country, which which means kind of you know something different. And would you, you know, we would, I, I would appreciate, I would be interesting to hear from you in this context, in this context of Russian aggression, the Poland's uh, strategic perspective and outlook, in addition to you know what Poland does uh, to to support the Ukraine currently. Thank you. Thank you, Eka, for invitation. Uh, really, Poland is a uh, um, country who is uh, neighboring to Ukraine, and we surviving very deeply this situation together with our Ukrainian neighbors. About we are expecting about a million of ref refugees, and even small cities in Poland, the people are receiving Ukrainians, mostly mothers and children. And this is the situation on the ground. But I would like to uh, draw your attention to a little bit mm, wider perspective when we consider the causes of, of the war started by Russia. We want to understand what was the cause, what was the reason, what was behind. Let us consider the reason and conclusions that should be drawn from it. There will be many answers and operational, political, military levels, but in my opinion, there is still a much deeper ground. The one that is visible in the behavior of the majority of Russians, represented people uh, from the Russian society supporting Putin. In recent hours, uh, today, I have observed a journalist um, survey on the streets of, of uh, Russia. Uh, the journalists were asked uh, regular people, what do you think about, they were showing uh, pictures from Ukraine and so on, so on. Most of the respondents answer that they are either support their president or that that the terrible information coming from hostile Western media that coming from Ukraine is false, fake, Western propaganda. The most radical statements are the most brave statements of, of Russian people this moment, these days are, I am for the peace, very general. And it costs for them, it costs arrests, you know, repressions and so on. So 
what happened in the minds of the Russians? Is it their fault that they believe the ideological nonsense of that the Kremlin propaganda gives them? Is their fault? In my opinion, a lot of the blame lies with with us fault on our side too because we have failed to do our job 30 years ago i mean the collapse of soviet union and well over the past 20 years we have downplayed the evil to come we agreed that the crimes of communism should be also don't play it. There was no Nuremberg trial. There was no, let's say, reconciliation after Bolshevism. And then that resulted with, with the convinced that Stalin is a nice character of an efficient manager governing a huge power huge empire. It is not Putin who has gone mad, mad and gone wild. It was Western societies. We that fed him becoming his involuntary allies. Anyone in the West, particularly in the in Germany, Austria, United Kingdom, France, can so say today, we are sorry, but we didn't know what Russia is preparing, was preparing for us. And I think these societies have no right to say that they knew nothing. I have a strong evidence. Please come back reading investigative journalist Jürgen Roth. This is the German well-known author of many books. Personally, I discovered him, his works, in 2011 uh, in a bookstore in my beloved Dresden, where I often go for weekends with my children. I was surprised the titles were Deutschland Mafia Land, Gangster Wirtschaft, so Gangster Economy, Gazprom, Das Unheimliche Imperium, so Secret in, uh, Imperium, and, and so on, so on. So he, he wrote mo many of, of such books. So he recovered a lot of documents. It is not a fantasy of, of journalists who is describing the the word that is think he's thinking that is uh, real. He was based on the on the documents from police attorney offices. From from uh, it is well documented. These books were published in tens of thousands of copies and were really to buy, you know, in bookstores. So I just bought some of them. All of them concern corruption in the West and economic patterns as well as political ties between the European elites and Russian oligarchs. For whom Putin is like a capo di tutti capi. Will anyone in German-speaking countries, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, say that he didn't know? But Jürgen Roth, his books, have been translated into many other languages, French, English, Spanish, Italian. In Poland, Jürgen Roth is popular, particularly after his publication of his last work about the plane crash of President Lech Kaczynski near Smolensk, 2010. 
Jürgen Roth recalled in his text what that Kaczynski addressed in August 2008 in Georgia, the rally in Tbilisi. We have come here together with presidents of other Central European countries, Lithuania, Latvia, Ukraine, Estonia, because Russia is a dangerous challenge for the entire continent. Today, Georgia. Tomorrow, Ukraine. The day after, tomorrow, the Baltic states. And then, it's time for my country, to Poland. Jürgen Roth died in 2017. He was 72 years old. As far as I know, the average life expectancy in Germany is well over 80 years. But forget it now. If any of, of the politicians in Western Europe, and also I can say honestly, in my country too, it's not only you know that, that I'm hinting others, of course. If any politician in Western Europe are still convinced that if Russia had not been irritated, I mean the expansion of NATO, uh, the expansion of EU was the result, now it's resulted with the, with the situation, I hear many voices uh, such, such a way, there would not have been this tragedy, and so on, so on. I would like to remind all of us that in 1939, Finland did not irritate Stalin. It was simply Stalin who concluded that the borders of the Russian Empire should be changed. I hope Putin breaks his teeth in Ukraine, as did Stalin in Finland. And finally, I would like to appeal to my Georgian friends. I have one proposal. I understand that you are in a very difficult situation. Small country, huge neighbor, difficult economical position, and you cannot speak out against Russia and support the sanctions. Okay, but please, make at least one symbolic gesture. Close the Stalin's Museum in Gori. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. You have touched upon many topics and issues that are very close to my heart and heart of Georgians. Um, and, uh, you know, really, you know, thank you. I appreciate, um, you know, this, uh, this legacy of Stalin's museum and the streets still named after Stalin in Gori is a, you know, severe burden for the, you know, for the majority of Georgians. Believe me. Thank you. And uh, let me. Yes, please. Sorry, I'm being very in Ahalsuke, when you go to Vale, uh, the border with Turkey, yeah. that street is called Stalin. And and you know the reason why we entered NATO is because exactly because of that region. What Stalin want to do with that? It is called Stalin, and I couldn't believe it when I saw that. So actually, if you're going to do anything about street names. I also think my personal request, please also take it off. <laughs> thank you. Jeremy, when that will be up to me, you know, I promise. And let's, you know, let's, let's see. Then, you know. <laughs> but let me switch to Andrew's ambassador of Lithuania, Ambassador um, uh, Kalindra. Um, you know, Russia is using uh, Belarus for the aggression against Ukraine. And, uh, you know, it's threatening NATO, it's threatening, you know, everyone around with nukes and, you know, terror. Uh, 
uh, I, you know, currently and right now our hearts and minds are directed towards Ukraine. But um, do you feel a kind of fear or threat of a military aggression against Lithuania and Baltic states? And also what I want to continue on what, you know, in the introduction I mentioned and that has been also touched upon during the speeches, what is the situation in Lithuania in terms of, uh, you know, what are Russians doing there? Are they trying to increase the pro-Russian sentiments? You know, I'm asking that because we do see that a lot in Georgia. We face the reality that alt enforce this conservative, ultra-nationalist, whatever, you know. I don't know how to name and label this, you know, this group. The offices are opening one after another in Georgia and their you know, narratives and messaging is uh, overwhelming round. So I'm just you know, asking, I'm just curious, is this Georgia specific uh, development or your country is also experiencing something like increase of Russian, Russian activities for promoting Russian narratives? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rondele Foundation and UECA for convening this meeting and uh, indeed it's uh, not easy to talk all of these, de on these developments without the emotions. Um, but at the outset uh, let me express the Lithuanians um, heartfelt sympathy, solidarity and support to Ukraine with the president of Ukraine who is becoming a hero. Let me guess that he will be awarded to the Nobel Peace Prize uh, this year and of course the government and all the people of Ukraine. And let me assure that in all international community stands with Ukraine. Before coming back to the Belarus, I would have wished to have on a podium Belarus ambassador to Georgia and to join him, uh, I mean invite him to also to join the round of applause to Ukraine. But I will come back to, to, to the Belarus issue a bit later. And uh, of course, today, what we're witnessing, and we're witnessing the military aggression against Ukraine, yes, it poses threat to, to, to all international community, to the region, to the Baltic states, to the, to the entire world of, of, of freedom and liberties. And uh, we're very glad that uh, the West uh, is, is very much united. Um, uh, by condemning uh, Russia's uh, actions and a violation of international law and uh, support, supporting the EU, Ukraine, sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity. Sanctions are playing a very important role. And uh, Lithuania is one of the countries that uh, encourages uh, on almost daily basis just to increase these, uh, these sanctions, to strengthen them up. Um, and uh, we urge partners, including our partners, to continue considering these additional steps, additional sanctions. Also increase assistance uh, to the affected people of uh, Ukraine, uh, also support to Ukraine defenders, and here let me appreciate the Polish people and Polish government. Indeed, there is a very huge load of the, of the refugees uh, from, from Ukraine. We, as a country, were committed uh, right now, 110% to, to support and assist Ukraine. And um, I would say that uh, resilience and, and the initiatives by the NGOs, they are very much uh, matter and, and are important. Uh, yesterday, the mayor of Vilnius uh, decided um, to rename uh, the name of a small a uh, small street uh, leading up to the Russian embassy, and as of today, the street is, is named as a Ukrainian heroes street. And the Russian embassy uh, is at the street of the Boris Nemtsov. So all these, acti all these uh, actions also where they prove that then this is a very clear message to, to the Kremlin. In last five days, uh, people of Lithuania uh, transferred uh, more than eight millions of, of euros to the special account to support Ukraine, to support, to defend Ukraine and, and, and um, the entire free world. We, the government has decided uh, to stop import of in, uh, Russian gas. In 2014, we built uh, the LNG terminal 
um, and uh, we have this uh, possibility to, to ensure the supply of the gas to, to the continent to the Baltic uh, states. And uh, this is very symbolic that the name of that terminal is Independence, and it operates since 2014. If I may, a bit uh, uh, about the international developments. Um, of course, today is the time to, to, to talk how to end the impunity, impunity of Russian sanctions. That started in the early 90s when they were continuing in, in, against Georgia, against Ukraine in 2014. Right now, we are continuing further on. And this is definitely the um, undisputable breach of the international law. Um, International Criminal Court uh, opened investigation. Uh, there is the joint international um, uh, international appeal. Also, my government uh, made a separate referral to, to, to the hack uh, base court. Um, today, we talked about the international solidarity. 141 countries they stood up for for UNJ resolution. My question is about other five plus 35 especially do we need indeed any more additional arguments what is happening uh, how russia acts against ukraine the people and these abstentions 35 if i'm not mistaken this is the big big question mark for all both countries of uh, the data, uh, within 141. in this context belarus and let's not uh, focus just on Russia, because uh, unlike in 2014, when the Belarusian president said that I will not ever let any Russian soldier to enter from my territory to Ukraine, so the situation has, has changed. The Russian soldiers right now are in, in, in Belarus. Um, we do doubt that they're going to leave Belarus themselves. Uh, and we, as a country, we do condemn the involvement of Belarus in, aggression, in, uh, in direct aggression, aggression against Ukraine. Um, also, we call to refrain from, from such actions, but we understand uh, that the military mobilization is taking place in Belarus. Um, there are many persons who wish to, 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 to leave Belarus, to, to, to through Georgia, escape Belarus. Um, and also additional element that this invasion coincides uh, with the so-called referendum on Belarus constitutional amendments that will allow Lukashenko to stay in power until 2035. Uh, we have, I mean, in Belarus there are more than 1,000 political prisoners and, and the future is, is, is not, uh, not a bright at all. And the motto of the referendum was that uh, the voting is taking place in an orderly manner. If you, people of Belarus, wish to participate and give your vote, please come. But the fact that there is no need, because everything is, is, is preempted. So today, Belarus, together with the uh, Russian Federation, is uh, on a dark page uh, of, of history. Um, about the, all the very recent developments at the uh, nuclear power plant in uh, Zaporizhia, um, I, I will abstain because it's uh, beyond, uh, beyond uh, everything. And what we're facing right now, this is not politics, this is a war, a war happening in the in, in heart of the uh, European continent. And this is our moral duty to support Ukraine today. Tomorrow may already be too late, we need all of us to be on, a, on, a, on the side of the truth and necessary steps uh, has to be taken, including diplomacy, to stop Putin and, and his ally, uh, Belarus. There is no kind of gray, gray, gray area or gray space for that. Um, and about the Russians uh, responding to the Russians' influence in Lithuania, probably Lithuania is not the right place for Russia just to, to, to do it. Uh, the resilience of society is at the highest possible point, and um, I would say we, we were the first country uh, stopping the performance of Russian artists, uh, concerts, uh, etc. If if it was um, related to the performers' uh, vocal uh, vocal uh, messages uh, about the Ukraine, about Crimea, about about Donbass, so. So, of course, uh, this is about the building of the state and statehood. 
this is the daily and hourly uh, and uh, hourly uh, commitment of all of us. And as it was said, uh, there is no need to be a, a soldier in order to become a hero. All of us, we uh, have a right and we have an obligation to be a heroes for our own countries. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Um, thank you for sharing your you know, positions and thoughts. And um, as we are um, running really late, and as most of you know, presenters here have other commitments, we, we have to um, stop in 15 minutes, if, if that's okay. So, uh, <laughs> okay, Nino, and then, no. please uh, present yourself sure. and be as precise as possible. Thank you. Thank you for this, for this opportunity. And hello, dear guests. Um, I will continue with the issue. Uh, uh, Mr. Kalindra finished his speech about being late. Yesterday, President Zel I'm, my name is Nino Gelashvili. I'm from the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. I'm a journalist. Uh, yesterday, uh, President Zelensky said that the whole world is late with Ukraine. And that's a feeling we all have, because we see that every moment, every second, people die in Ukraine. Uh, the sanctions and the instruments, international instru instruments used now, were actually impossible to imagine one, two, or more years ago to be imposed against Russia. But it, those are possible today, after Russia reinvaded Ukraine. What do you think should be the point when the West would find effective instrument to stop Russia? Do we face, do we witness uh, lack of international instruments or do we witness a lack of consensus like we did in the past? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mr. Kasyanov, um, in August 2008, I was Georgian Charger in London, so I know exactly what you're going through. Uh, my respect, solidarity, and the best wishes. Um, and I re may re remember my desperation when uh, for days and days uh, my uh, appeals and, and warnings were not really reaching many people. Um, I will skip the I told you so part. For years, we've been warning uh, what was going to happen. And just a practical question, Ambassador Degnan. Um, thank you for your wonderful uh, contribution, uh, for the leadership your country is trying to provide, and uh, many efforts that we've already seen uh, in, in real life. Um, uh, however, there is one serious problem with Russia uh, that uh, its leadership doesn't really care about the suffering uh, and economic misery that the sanctions already in place have, are starting delivering to their people. Let's skip again the long history of uh, the Russian leaders kind of uh, being comfortable with the sometimes aggressive obedience of their own people. Uh, is the United States and allies um, together with allies, prepared to go after real wealth of the Russian oligarchs, because those villas in Miami and in London and others, are, and their uh, yachts are just the tip of iceberg, real money, real wealth, that actually works against the Western values, has been working for years, is well hidden, some of them for 30 years. Is the United States ready to cooperate with those experts? For instance, I can give you a number, number of names from London and other places who have been studying the hidden wealth of Russian oligarchs to go after the real power of Putin's cronies. 
Yeah, thank you, and thank you to all. I'm Pat Agapinda Shuelik Gras. Um, dear uh, Andri Cassiano, first of all, let me tell you that I feel sorry, and we all are sorry for uh, not seeing today at this panel uh, dear Ambassador Igor Dolgov of uh, Ukraine. But of course, uh, against all odds, you, I know that you are sure that uh, all in Ukraine uh, now are in thoughts and prayers of uh, the people of Georgia every day and uh, every hour. Um, and of course, uh, you know it better than us that not only fate uh, of Ukraine and Ukrainians and all in Ukraine uh, uh, are being decided now, but the fate of my country and all citizens uh, in Georgia. And therefore, let me let us uh, fully conquer uh, with the belief of 90% of those in Ukraine who uh, who say that uh, Ukraine will win. My question will be rather uh, concrete to you. You, of course, uh, repeated the appeal of the Ukrainian authorities to the uh, with allies in America, in Europe, in Turkey, elsewhere, um, to support further uh, with, for instance, increasing, uh, 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 helping to increase Ukraine's air defense capabilities. Can you tell us uh, uh, anything more concrete, whether, whether certain solid pragmatic steps have been taken already, for instance, in providing aircrafts? Um, and if I may now to echo to our dear Fatma's distinguished ambassador of Turkey's, uh, Turkey's words, an appeal to, to, to us, to Georgians, that unity in Georgia is needed as ever. And the question, as well as an appeal from my side, would be to you all, and please, if you would love to comment on that, will you please further assist us in, for instance, getting now and not in a month time or so, uh, Georgian government as well as opposition to issue a single statement, for instance, uh, and recommit, and nothing wrong in recommitting, recommit themselves in pursuing reforms, including implementing those commitments which were enshrined, or still are enshrined, uh, in 19th of April, you mediated document that is called Charles Michel document. And once again, thank you very much, Eka and Rondelli Foundation for, for getting this meeting of solidarity today. Thank, thank you, thank you, Pata. And let's, um, you know, who wants to pick up on Nino's question, and then there are specific. Uh, I can start with that and then uh, address uh, Georgi's point there, uh, because others may have comments on your question, Nino, as well. Um, I, I think there's been a remarkable show of consensus, but uh, uh, the organizations that we have here, whether it's NATO or the European Union or um, the United Nations, they are consensus-based uh, organizations that depend on a process of, of reaching consensus, which uh, takes time. And I would say that uh, in some ways, Mr. Putin forced um, forced us all to focus that on the fact that he was willing to do what none of us wanted to believe he, he was choosing. Um, I think the offers that were put on the table as a result of all of our consultations um, in, the, uh, in the beginning of January were realistic and they were designed to address the concerns that Mr. Putin claimed were the basis for his threats to um, attack Ukraine, uh, and yet they were, they were disregarded. Um, so if we are playing by one set of rules, which are the rules that, have, that we have all agreed on and lived by for uh, 70 years um, about how we engage with each other, and the Kremlin is playing by a different set of rules, which I think is what we have discovered, um, then that is part of why we uh, maybe had the timeline that we had. I personally believe we had to give 
diplomacy, and we have to continue to give diplomacy every possible shot um, and, and, and try to pin down the Russians on what is really behind this. Um, and, and as we see, strip away the excuses that are, that are put on the table for the raw aggression that is really behind this. Um, I think that is, in, is very consistent with our values. And some of the values are unique to those in the world who believe in liberty and freedom. Um, and not all countries in the world do believe in liberty and freedom for their people. That's why we're fighting now. Uh, Georgi, on your, on your question, just, um, uh, well, I would say we, we very much are, and I would say it is in um, coordination with countries like the United Kingdom and others that have uh, aggressive uh, cor corruption um, frameworks. Um, we have been working with many countries, including Georgia, including Ukraine, on anti-corruption efforts. Uh, you have to build a case, and sometimes this wealth is very well hidden uh, and takes some time to, to expose. Things like the Pandora Papers um, um, help a lot, but it, you have to build a case because we are countries that believe in the rule of law. Um, but I, I guarantee you <laughs> that there is a lot of effort going to that very point, because you're right. The idea of sanctions, as well as the idea of these anti-corruption efforts, is to uh, change the behavior, not just of Mr. Putin himself, but of the cronies around him that have benefited from this, this system, um, this corrupt system that has evolved um, and that, that exists in some of our own countries because it takes advantage of our, uh, our, our laws by, through evasion. Um, so I would definitely um, say we are trying to influence behavior through that very method. Um, and uh, again, I, uh, my, the last point, Pata, on your question, I think what was done yesterday, uh, but even before yesterday, in terms of the uh, Georgians' negotiations with the European Union on its association agenda, very much reinforce what the roadmap that, you know, it doesn't matter if you call it the April 19th um, agreement or anything, those are the reforms that Georgia has, has agreed need to be done, that ev almost every political leader here agreed needs to be done here in Georgia. There's no discussion about what needs to be done, it's just a matter now of doing it. And, and if the application for expedited candidacy is serious, then that is, the roadmap ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a couple of questions. And first of all, let me also, by using this opportunity to thank you, the uh, Georgia, the Georgian people, and all the uh, society for supporting Ukraine at this most difficult period of times. Uh, all kind of support right now even which is coming from Georgia, from our friends, are important. We know that the government provided humanitarian assistance, and today we have the clear messages that it will be some more humanitarian assistance to Ukraine, and uh, we are grateful for that one, and we are grateful for the political support Georgia provides to Ukraine in all international arena. As to the other questions in terms of the air defense capabilities, of course, it's a question to our partners. We know that North Atlantic Council of NATO uh, is going to be held today, and Minister for Foreign Affairs, Dmitry Kuleba, will address them. Right now, we clearly know and we hope our messages will help the European Union and NATO countries to come more quicker to the consensus, since we have uh, the clear signals about nuclear threats, we have the clear signals that Russia undermines Ukrainian security, uh, Ukrainian nuclear security and safety, and the radiation has no bounds. That is, must be clear for our European partners, and I hope it will provoke them for quicker reaction to find a consensus to organize the air defense or to close the airspace. We have the plan B, A, we have the plan B, but at this stage, I would probably limit myself to this answer. As to the 
different military capabilities uh, we do receive. Again, it's the matter of some political arrangements and bilateral arrangements with air, our air allies. You will be surprised from what countries we receive it, but we do receive it. As the President of Zelensky clearly stated, these capabilities will come and even more. And Ukraine will have all possible means to protect ourselves and our uh, nations. As to the, as in terms of the international response, of course, and sanctions, it was very nice questions. And Ukraine always, you probably know, said, we need preemptive approach. We need to adopt the sanctions before the conflicts. It would help us even not to stop, but to soften at least consequences. Therefore, we strongly encourage all the partners and all the nations which have not been done so to join to the sanctions regime to apply full sanctions against the aggressor state. And of course, Ukraine is strong, is confident, is ready to work with the international community to consolidate all the international assistance to stop the aggression and defeat the enemy. Thank you so much. And of course, the door for diplomacy is open. It doesn't mean that we are give up from the diplomacy channels. It's undertaken. We are ready also to participate, and we welcome uh, the uh, willingness of some of the states to actively to be involved in this in order to, first of all, to cease the fire, to cease fire, and find the political solutions to this war. As to the Belarusia, uh, and uh, of course, uh, Mr. Kalinda clearly stated uh, about the Lukashenko's role in this one and about his previously promises not to come to Ukraine, but we saw that mobilization is taking place. I would like to tell you that Ukraine not the aggressor state, but let me outline the message of the Secretary of the National Defense of Ukraine, that Ukra Ukraine will be ready to launch the preemptive strikes, missile strikes to Belarus once it decided to go to war to Ukraine. We count on your understanding on this issue. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. And we are really short of time and two brief questions, as I've promised already to Sergei and but only Valery. Okay, to Sergei. Uh, thank you, Sergei Kabanadze from Gras. I have a very brief question to Ambassador Tegnan and uh, Mr. Cassiano together. So the Russians have put forward their demands for the negotiations. That is one, recognition of Crimea as part of Russia. Second, recognition of Donetsk and Luhansk as independent states. Third, uh, uh, full demilitarization. And fourth, uh, denazification. Uh, uh, is there any room for negotiations on these demands? What do you think? Thank you. Yes. Uh, first of all, our, we pray for our Ukrainian sisters and brothers, and our thoughts are with, with Ukraine. And a very short question again, uh, Madam Ambassador, to you. I understand that non-fly zone is now critical component. Uh, I understand the complications. It's not an easy question, but maybe it's worth to, to think about the limited non-fly zone, at least in the adjacent areas to NATO space. I mean. Uh, Polish, uh, Ukrainian, Romanian, Ukrainian border, or over the critical components of infrastructure like uh, nuclear nuclear stations, because it poses a real threat to whole Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, I would probably answer in this way that uh, as of now, Ukrainian people and Ukrainian soldiers are dying for Ukraine, are dying for the to protect and uphold the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine with its, within its internationally recognized borders, including Crimea and including temporary occupied territories of Lugansk and Donetsk Oblast. Of course, the negotiation process is taking place, and we know that we are only trying to negotiate and to realize humanitarian corridors just to elevate the life of people of wounded and provide medical assistance and food supplies for the both sides. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I think the, that, that question is really a, a question for the Ukrainians uh, as to what, they're, what terms they want to negotiate. But uh, I think we're only beginning to see 
um, you know, the, the rounds of nego negotiations begin. And thank you for your suggestion on a limited um, no-fly zone. Um, obviously, there's a lot of thought going into that. And as you say, it's an extremely complicated uh, issue if, if, because what we're trying to do is de-escalate the situation um, without giving Russia cause to escalate it further. Thank you. Uh, with this, we you know, should end, and thank you very much to our speakers um, and to the audience um, and to be with us in this difficult but very important moment. And with this, you know, I can end only with, uh, again, expressing solidarity to Ukraine and, uh, and wish the strength to you and to the whole world to stand together against the aggression. Slava Ukraini.
Hello? Čart je tra? Es mi te hače mi hva? Im meru ar mes pus pagat hva? Uh, hello, dear panelists, can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, we are running a little bit late because uh, we did not initially plan this, but we had the first panel of the ambassadors because everybody wanted to express solidarity. Uh, and uh, it took a bit longer. Uh, Mr. Kardash, welcome. I'm Shota Utiashvili. I'll be your moderator. And
progress. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, sorry, late start. Uh, and I'm still trying to figure out if I have all my speakers lined up to this particular stage. Uh, and uh, well, uh, we have listened to the ambassadors, so we have listened to the official positions of uh, 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 U.S., Poland, Turkey, uh, Ukraine itself, obviously, uh, uh, Lithuania. Uh, and now, if I have Mr. Taras Kutsio, Dr. Taras Kutsio, uh, I would like to give him a floor. Do we, do we have him? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, we were very happy to have the Ukrainian acting ambassador here, and he get, uh, got a standing ovation uh, as a representative of the people whose bravery, whose defense of their, of their land has caused international admiration. Uh, but um, now we want to hear from you, your, is your assessment of the situation on the ground. Uh, it's no, there's no need to say that we all stand with Ukraine, and uh, you can look probably. Well, you cannot see, but you know it's full of the Ukrainian uh, uh, pictures supporting Ukraine, uh, so to speak, and we are all wearing these skins. Um, so, not to take any, not to waste any uh, any more time, because we, we are still starting starting a bit late. Dr. Kutsio, please give us your assessment of what is going on and where it's all heading. Thank you. Well, the, this, is a, this is a war in the 21st century undertaken by a president of a country living in the late 19th century. His entire rationale for launching this war is that Ukrainians don't exist. Ukrainians are a branch of the Russian people. So what we have had in the last sort of nearly two decades especially since the Rose and Orange Revolutions, is an evolution of Russian nationalism in the Kremlin, which has gone back to Tsarist and white emigre nationalism, which denies the existence of Ukraine, denies the existence of Ukrainians. Um, this is worse than, than in the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, Ukraine and Ukrainians and Ukraine language was recognized. Of course, we had Russification, but it, they were recognized. Ukraine was a founding member of the United Nations, this is a, a war against a founding member of the United Nations. Ukraine has been a member for 80 years because Stalin uh, negotiated three positions, three seats at the UN. Soviet Union, Ukraine, Belarus. Um, so this is more than just um, a, a question of uh, an invasion to conquer Ukraine. Putin really does believe the crazy things he says, like yesterday's Security Council, Russian Security Council meeting. He really does believe that the majority of Ukrainians are little Russians who want to live in the Russian world, and that the West Ukrainian fascist nationalists who came to power in the Euromaidan are ruling the country on behalf of US puppet, as US puppets. This is why it makes it so complicated for Western, I think, policymakers and experts to understand because it really does need some understanding of these aspects of Russian identity, Russian nationalism. Now, Russians have always had a problem in recognizing Ukraine as a separate independent country, even under Boris Yeltsin. But, of course, this is, nobody, nobody would have thought, even the Putin 20 years ago, but never mind the Boris, Yel, uh, Boris Yeltsin, would have launched a full-scale invasion. Um, what Putin has done and what he began to do in 2014, he has actually destroyed pro-Russianism completely in Ukraine. Um, you, you, you have a kind of completely surreal situation where a president of Russia who claims to be defending Russian or protecting Russian speakers is destroying Kharkiv, a Russian speaking city. The symbolism, the symbolism of this is even greater because Kharkiv was the first capital of Soviet Ukraine. Putin is destroying the first capital of Soviet Ukraine. Um, it, he is also claiming that his, his goal is the denazification of Ukraine in a country led by a Jewish president. 
Um, so, of course, this is a problem. The core problem of this war is Putin's obsession with Ukraine and Putin's mentality. There's something deeply disturbing about this individual, which has got worse in the last two years during the isolation of the COVID uh, pandemic. What does he mean by denazification? He means the Belarusianization of Ukraine. That's what he means. He means to transform Ukraine into something resembling Lukashenko's Belarus. Now, even in the Soviet Union, Ukraine never resembled Belarus, never. Um, Ukraine had the biggest dissident and opposition movement in the Soviet Union. Um, and in the, in the Gulag, it was always Ukrainians, Georgians, and the Baltic, Re Baltic Republic, uh, dissidents. Um, there were very few Belarusian dissidents. Belarus was even then very Russified and not very strong in its opposition movement. So Ukraine was never like Belarus. To transform Belarus, Ukraine into a Belarus, would require repression on a Stalinist level. Um, the US intelligence has released documents of which allegedly are from the, from the Kremlin of a kill list. People who would be um, arrested or executed by Russian occupation authorities. What, what kind of people are we talking about? Well, of course, those Ukrainians with a pro-Ukrainian identity, not with a pro-Russian identity, with a pro-Ukrainian identity, who are also pro-Western. That means politicians, civil society activists, academics, journalists, and so on, um, including as well clerics. There have already been killings of Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the autocephalous Orthodox Church of, of, of two priests. What Putin expects, if this is a country that in his eyes would then return to normality. His normality is that Ukraine should look, should be little Russia, should look like Belarus. This has tremendous, of course, implications for Ukrainians because it means bloodshed, it means um, destruction of their identity. It means, you know, it's, it, it's the second genocide in a hundred years by a, a, a Russian leader who, who, who is a big fan of Joseph Stalin. Um, and it also has massive uh, ramifications for, for the West, for Western security, which nobody is talking about. If the West has a problem with Lukashenko's Belarus, which it did in December with the, um, with the weaponization of migrants, think of what problems the West will have if Ukraine becomes a Belarus as well. That would be an additional 50, 45 million people. A huge country with a huge military industrial complex, Ukraine. Ukraine and Belarus together, their two borders would border practically all, I think all of the NATO EU members of Central Eastern Europe, every single one. This would be a return to the height of the Cold War, conflict on the border of of Ukraine, Belarus, and, 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 the, and the West. So this has tremendous ramifications. And just a final point. Yes, of course it's true that Putin thinks he's at war with the West. The West has refused to accept that, that this. The West has refused to acknowledge this for, for a long time. Putin first declared he was at war with the West in his speech to the Munich Security Conference in February 2007. What did Barack Obama do? Launch a reset after, after Russia invaded Georgia. Um, no wonder Obama's name is, is dirt in, and is, is, a, is, a, is a dirty word in both Georgia and Ukraine. Um, so the, that, that sig signifies that um, this is, has tremendous implications for the West because Putin has always believed well, at least since 2014, that he is fighting a war with the West in Ukraine. This is a, a, a proxy war against the West, which was until for the last eight years, it was covert, hybrid warfare, and now it's overt. There's no question he sees this as a war to, to, to fight in his fight against the West, in his xenophobic fight with the West. And he, he if you listen to his speech yesterday, he believes 
but it was the West that falsely created a so-called nationalist state on, U on Russia's borders. So he believes that this is a US puppet state that he is destroying um, in Ukraine. And that, um, that the goal is to fracture, to bring down NATO and the European Union. An old Soviet goal, which is now Putin's goal. Um, so believe you me, if, um, if Ukraine is allowed to be destroyed, allowed to be occupied, allowed to become a second Belarus, then there's without question, watch out three Baltic states and watch out Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kuccio. Uh, we will have the slight changes in the schedule, schedule uh, um, uh, because Mr. Sherba has to go quite soon as he has to attend an important meeting. And uh, if, he is, uh, if he is here, Yes, okay, yeah, he seems to be here. And my apologies to Mr. Umland uh, for keeping him, but if five, maybe five more minutes. Okay, then uh, since Mr. Sherba is not here, Okay, then, uh, yes, Mr. Umland, uh, then we will start with you, and then when Mr. Sherba comes, he, uh, uh, we'll give the floor to him. So, uh, Mr. Umland, uh, are you in Ukraine, first of all, and, and are you safe? Yeah. Okay. No, I was by accident when the war broke out in Germany, and then wanted to go back to, to Kiev, but couldn't. So, um, my friends and... and, and uh, Close friends, friends are still there, and um, I'm now stuck here in Germany, uh, although I live in, in Ukraine for uh, 20 years now. Um, so I, I guess we have already clarified uh, the question, now let's get to the question, um, um, the, um, the main issues here are how can one quickly stop uh, the war, and I think we have now, of course, a very impressive sanctions package, but there are still uh, large energy imports from Russia to the European Union. Apparently, Russia is still getting millions and millions per day euros from the European Union for the gas and for the oil and for the coal that uh, the European Union is still delivering, uh, um, uh, importing on a large scale. And, um, you know, you can sort of understand that uh, people say we are actually dependent on that. Uh, although I'm not sure what, what here the, the term dependency really means, uh, how, you know, how many people would die if we, don't, if we stop uh, importing Russian gas or Russian oil or Russian coal. Um, but there's a whole industry of sort of uh, justifying this and sort of arguing that, you know, to stop this, this is um, allegedly impossible. Um, I think with, with the most recent events uh, around the nuclear power plants in uh, the Nikolaev region and in the Saporizhia region, there should be growing awareness that this is not just about solidarity, empathy, and helping Ukraine, but, but this is about our own basic national security interests. It's about the, our own health and our own countries. Um, imagine uh, we have a, a meltdown of a reactor as we had in in Chernobyl in 1986, uh, the Saporizhia nuclear power plant is the largest one in Europe with six active reactors. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, and there are altogether 15 such reactors in Ukraine. They cannot, they cannot be, uh, um, uh, uh, they cannot be disengaged because the uh, Ukraine needs the uh, electricity. Uh, um, there is a, a shortfall of electricity in any way. So, Ukraine has no other choice than to actually run all of these um, currently available 15 reactors. And um, the, the problem here is maybe not so, so much that uh, um, such a reactor will be uh, directly hit with a grenade or with a bomb, but as I've learned now also, uh, I've read a little bit about this, you need actually for these reactors to run uh, properly, 
you need um, a certain stable personnel and infrastructure. So you need the right engineers, the, the right techni technicians to do the right things at the right moment. And you, you need enough water, you need enough material and so on. And if this, uh, if this supply of personnel and material um, now uh, is breaking down because of the war, uh, this could, could be very risky. And I think that should then motivate also to, um, to now think about these holy cows of the gas imports and the, and the oil imports and the coal imports. Oil plays a large role for the Russian state budget. Um, uh, if you look at the, at the statistics, uh, I think it's around the, the income from the oil exports is around 40%. The issue here is not uh, that we can simply, uh, um, uh, you know, Russia will, of course, if we don't import the oil, Russia will have this oil still available. The, the real issue here is that Russia currently can transport large amounts of oil via uh, large transport pipelines into the EU. And if we stop that, then Russia would have to first build an infrastructure, uh, uh, ports and tank tankers, um, you know, the, the whole infrastructure to export these um, large amounts of oil uh, to other regions of the world. And then we could still sanction this. We could, we could, we could actually, you know, for instance, sanction uh, countries, other countries that would, would buy Russian oil. Uh, a similar story goes now for gas. Until a few uh, years ago, um, uh, there was a certain gas dependency. You could argue uh, industries and, and, and households being actually uh, sort of reliant on Russian gas. But now this situation has changed. We have LNG liquefied gas. We have LNG terminals in Europe. We can organize an alternative gas supply with, without Russian gas. That will probably lead to an increase of, uh, of gas prices, of oil prices, but this is possible. And we should do that, and we should do that sooner uh, uh, rather than later, uh, because the, the war needs to end. The other um, issue that I've just uh, posted um, um, a tweet about it, maybe you've seen it, is that we can actually, if we want to, implement a no-fly zone or something close to a no-fly zone in Ukraine without involving NATO. Um, the proposal I have made is to basically secure a couple of West Ukrainian airports to hand over to Ukraine with, with anti-aircraft installations. We could transport anti-aircraft installations to such airports um, and, uh, um, and other technology to, the, to such air, airports uh, that are not yet uh, in the, uh, you know, where, where Russian troops are not yet close. Um, we could then, um, give over to Ukraine um, uh, de decommissioned airplanes. Uh, we could simply make them Ukrainian, you know, as a present, basically, uh, you know, we paint them with Ukrainian colors, and then we could make a call for uh, Air Force veterans in the West to join the mili uh, Ukrainian military, perhaps even become Ukrainian citizens. And we could then bring these Air Force veterans to these West Ukrainian airports get them on the planes and fly sorties uh, over Ukrainian state um, uh, territory. That would be uh, one way perhaps to, uh, to arrange that. Probably it's not as easy as, as, not, as I've now outlined uh, this plan. Um, and there are lots of technicalities uh, uh, that would need to have to be observed. But at least that is, uh, would be a sort of response to the most central um, demand that we've heard over the last few days from Ukraine that Ukraine needs a no-fly zone um, and that uh, Ukraine can deal with uh, Russian ground forces if, uh, if, the, if Ukraine is sort of uh, uh, um, freed from this threat from the air, uh, then the Ukrainian ground forces uh, can take care of the Russian ground forces, then um, uh, the Ukrainian army can win this war without a, a no-fly zone or something like a no-fly zone, at least to sort of land lease um, arrangement uh, um, uh, uh, a significant presence of uh, of modern ukrainian airplanes flown by such volunteers from the west who could be made uh, ukrainian officers or even ukrainian citizens uh, uh, ukraine will have problems uh, you know uh, winning this uh, this war so uh, we have to think creatively here uh, obviously nato doesn't want to get involved directly Everybody's afraid of um, World War III. I think this is also a psychological operation by Putin. He is scaring consciously 
the Western public not to get involved too much, but we have now already entered this war with, uh, with our weapons deliveries. There are now apparently thousands and thousands of uh, citizens of NATO countries uh, going to Ukraine as volunteers. So um, why not then uh, uh, add to these current volunteers also uh, fighter uh, pilots and why not add to the current anti-aircraft missiles, anti-tank missiles, fighter planes and, and get these um, pilots into the planes and, um, uh, and arrange, you know, the sort of, uh, make it, somehow arrange the, the technological, um, you know, the operation of this and, uh, and uh, let them fight if, they, if they're ready to for, uh, for Ukraine. We need something like that. I think there's an, uh, a too much um, too much fear here of uh, Russia uh, starting a war with NATO, uh, because if you if you assume that Russia is ready to start a, uh, a war with NATO, why did Russia never capture the most Russian city outside Russia, which is uh, the Estonian city of Narva? It's not as some maybe think uh, the uh, Ukrainian city of Sevastopol, but Narva is more Russian than Sevastopol. And um, Russia never made an attempt to capture uh, Narva, which is right on the Russian uh, Estonian border. It's about 135 kilometers away from uh, Putin's birthplace, uh, St. Petersburg. Russia never tried to capture um, Narva. It could have captured Narva, and uh, it would have been difficult for, for NATO to respond to a Russian capture of Narva, because, you know, what would, what would uh, if, if Russian troops uh, move into Narva, which is 95% uh, Russian, um, there would be little resistance, presumably. What would, what would NATO do? Would NATO then bomb Narva? So um, uh, Russia has never done that, and that indicates that Russia is not ready for a war uh, with NATO um, because, you know, the enormous threats uh, that, you know, the Russian generals, the Russian politicians would, uh, would then uh, face themselves and their families and, you know, their children, their their wives and so on. So Russia is not ready for that, and that's why we we should be uh, creative in uh, supporting uh, Ukraine. We should be uh, not sending just anti-aircraft missiles, anti-tank missiles. Uh, that means defensive weapons. We should send offensive weapons, and we should um, not just send ordinary volunteers. We should um, send highly qualified military men as volunteers uh, who could become. Um, all the members of the uh, Ukrainian army or even Ukrainian citizens, and then um, actually operate these high-tech weapons that we should provide. That is, I think, the way to go. And um, uh, and uh, you know, we should uh, we should make sure that all, all our solidarity and empathy and emotions are actually somehow you know canalized cana 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 into action and not merely into sort of sympathetic statements and walking around with the Ukrainian flag or something like this. This is not helping much, and it's actually already uh, causing um, uh, confusion And in, in Ukraine that, you know, you have lots of verbal and symbolic support, but and, and then you have lots of support, of course, of, of the refugees, but, but Ukraine needs support in a war. And so uh, the, uh, the support should be military and not, uh, not just symbolic, verbal, or, uh, you know, uh, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, certainly we need we need creative ideas. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, our goal is not punishing Russia, but first and foremost, our goal is saving Ukraine, because um, th th this is by far bigger um, um, a bigger task. I would think. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Michal Sherba, the Polish MP. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us. And the question is again, what just uh, what I just said, uh, punishing Russia is one thing, saving uh, Ukraine is much more important. What more should be done to save Ukraine? What more should be done to make sure that Ukraine doesn't lose this war? Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I send my best uh, greetings from uh, Warsaw. Uh, as you know, probably it was mentioned by uh, other speakers, uh, uh, in Poland we, uh, under any uh, political, uh, political affiliations, we, we, the whole parliament, the whole government, the whole opposition, uh, we support uh, Ukraine. 
and uh, I would like to express my deepest solidarity with the people of Ukraine, the brave people, the brave soldiers, uh, the brave civilians. Um, it's a very important time uh, of this uh, conference because uh, before uh, I, I was able to listen to Secretary General of NATO, uh, Stoltenberg, who already announced uh, the uh, the information about uh, after after the foreign ministers meeting and in uh, in half an hour i also join uh, nato parliamentary assembly urgent uh, ukraine nato in the parliamentary council uh, with a small format for co chairmen and the president of the nato pa and um, i i just want to know that it's our obligation uh, to support ukraine now um, and uh, my my opinion is that that uh, uh, ukraine is now a victim of the geopolitical terrorism of putin and uh, the ukrainian army and ukrainian people are not uh, just uh, defending their independence uh, and uh, the, their european choice uh, the choice uh, already Ukraine and Georgia made, but they are defending all the values that are fundamental to NATO and the entire democratic, civilized, and peaceful uh, world. Uh, what we can do uh, as uh, as uh, as countries, as uh, institutions, organizations, uh, of course, uh, we arch uh, within. Ukraine NATO parliamentary interparliamentary council um, all member states of the North Atlantic Alliance to step up their comprehensive support and to further enhance the defense capabilities of of the Ukrainian army by providing military assistance sharing intelligence and equipment through NATO mechanism a lot of NATO countries a lot of EU countries decided to send uh, the military equipment to Ukraine, it's uh, using, and I hope it will be used uh, more and more. But uh, I also would like to urge uh, the countries uh, uh, who do not participate in this uh, process. It's a historic time, and uh, you cannot be neutral. I'm, I'm telling it to to Hungary. I'm telling to mm, to other uh, to other countries. Uh, if you were, if you are alliance, if you are partners, we have obligation to fulfill. And uh, I also think that the significant in the, in, uh, the significant, uh, it, it, we have to enlarge uh, the list of sanctioned persons and legal entities connected directly or indirectly with the Russian regime, including families of Russian oligarchs and senior officials. And there should be no gaps in this process. If we agree on sanctions, just do it. Just uh, uh, let's do it. Yeah, without uh, gaps, uh, there are still happening things. Uh, also in my country, that Slovakia is asking uh, um, Poland because they need some fuel from Moscow uh, to deliver uh, by plane, and so on and so on. No, if we need, uh, if you want to stop Putin. Just stop them, stop him and stop them, yes? Uh, also, my idea that I will present today to the, to the UNIC meeting is to expel Russian diplomats engaged in hostile activities, including spreading hate speech, disinformation, and fueling the conflict by voicing anti-Ukrainian rhetoric. That happened also in Poland. The ambassador, uh, who is still in Warsaw, the Russian ambassador are delivering interviews, you know, blaming Ukraine for what's happened, saying that Ukraine has no right to, to be an independent state. It has to be stopped. This kind of diplomats has no place in our in our country. And uh, also, the most important thing, what we can do. That that was the question. Yes, um, we need to uh, uh, we need to. Uh, fulfill the humanitarian uh, corridors to save evacuation of women, children, the elderly, and people with disabilities. 
and to guarantee their security in direct cooperation with the International Committee of Red Cross in accordance with the mandate under 1949 Geneva Conventions. We demand from Russia Federation to respect security guarantees of these corridors. And there are two organizations that has to be involved in this process. One of this is the OSCE, and the second is uh, uh, the, the UN. So, uh, um, as you know, the Ukrainian uh, side also raised uh, uh, the appeal. Uh, the Ukrainian side, I mean the, the Verkhovna Rana of Ukraine, uh, uh, also uh, may, uh, prepared an address to, 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 the, to the free world. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we have to take into consideration this. Uh, uh, this uh, this proposal. Coming back to Poland, uh, I will end up with this. Uh, we have uh, we we have uh, a big uh, festival of uh, solidarity uh, with Ukraine, uh, and it's not just uh, preparing resolutions uh, and uh, putting. Uh, uh, Ukrainian flags in our uh, in our uh, in our public places. Uh, it's uh, a real help. We me too. We do every day. Uh, in the last eight days, uh, it's almost six hundred thousand Ukrainians, mostly mothers, children, and uh, and uh, grandmothers. Uh, who uh, who are in 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 Poland now? Eighty percent of this, uh, as I said, six hundred thousand people, refugees, Ukrainian refugees, war refugees, uh, are coming to my capital, to my uh, my city, which is capital city of Warsaw. It's a big uh, process we have to provide, and uh, uh, you, I want you to know there is no refugee camps in my country yet. So it means that uh, the, the, the part of this group uh, goes to the Ukrainian who are already in Poland, because we have a lot of Ukrainian workers in Poland, but uh, the majority of this group is invited to the private houses, private apartments of the Polish, um, Polish people. So, uh, so this, is, this is something unique because it's, it, it's, it, it's uh, um, a direct uh, expression of our solidarity. Uh, we want these uh, people to feel like at home, and we feel this process as a big investment of Polish, of the EU relation with independent, sovereign, uh, and integral Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there is an applause applause for you uh, because that part when. The ordinary uh, Pol Poles take uh, Ukrainian refugees to their homes is um, is very very appealing. Thank you, Mr. Sherba. And uh, thank you. Uh, now uh, back to the back to the region to the neighbors. Uh, Shaban Kardash is uh, waiting for us uh, from Istanbul, I think, or Ankara. 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 Okay. And uh, yeah, the Turkish role is really important. I mean, Turks. Have uh, Turkish Bayraktars have been uh, one of the heroes of this war so far, uh, and uh, Turkey has um, shown that it is active, actively supporting uh, Ukraine. But uh, what more can Turkey do, and how does Turkey see the unfolding events? The floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation. Also, thank you to all other uh, participants. The Turkish ambassador, uh, Ceren Hanım, has already outlined uh, some of the main uh, parameters of Turkey's policy in that uh, crisis. Uh, I will, of course, share my own views from a think tank and academic uh, perspective. Uh, personally, I mean, I am one of those who believe that entire Western transatlantic community has failed to react to the Russian revisionism or neo-revisionism, however we call it, in the last uh, 
two decades or so, uh, I mean, this is to some extent a theoretical uh, debate, as we have seen with the discussions about who provoked Russia, whether Russia was provoked, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, in my understanding, uh, there are different reasons why there was a failure to read properly the implications of the Russian uh, revisionism. Uh, and in my understanding, uh, part of it is related to bilateral concerns of different countries. When it comes to Germany, they had their own issues, uh, sensitivities in not properly reacting uh, to the Russian uh, policies. When it comes to other European countries, they had their own justifications and also for Turkey as well. There were some reasons, the energy dependence, the uh, economic ties, the tourism revenues, so on and so forth. But beyond all these uh, particular concerns of uh, different uh, countries, NATO countries, Western countries, including uh, Turkey, an important uh, factor was about the strategic ambiguity uh, behind the Russian uh, steps. Uh, many of uh, the countries in the West, uh, they, instead of taking the pessimistic view, want to take the optimistic view about the Russian steps starting from the 2008 uh, Georgia war. And instead of looking at the uh, glass half uh, empty, they prefer to look at the glass half full. But uh, as we have seen uh, now, uh, this kind of dreaming, daydreaming is over. Everybody has to uh, realize uh, and confront with this new reality. But at the same time, the way this realization and reckoning with this new reality is happening, it is also uh, creating new strategic challenges to many actors, including Turkey. So in that sense, uh, as is popularly argued, Turkey is always finding itself in between, balancing the West on the one hand and the, uh, Russia on the other hand. So in that sense, this delicate position of Turkey has been always there and it is still there, and especially in the coming phase uh, in terms of how to best react to uh, this new reality, Turkey will still uh, seek to maintain that kind of a balanced approach. But despite that, I just wrote something for the German Marshall Fund, which was uh, released yesterday, There, I argue that despite all these concerns to maintain the ties with both sides, Turkey is taking uh, some steps that are in a sense seeking to uh, counter the Russian uh, moves in this geography because the negative damaging implications for Turkey of what's going on in Ukraine and afterwards is obviously out there. But the dependence, energy dependence, economic relations, but the broader geopolitical uh, concerns are also taken into account and that's why Turkey is taking some steps uh, that may not satisfy all of the transatlantic community members, especially the issue about the airspace, although on the question of the uh, maritime regime, in, uh, enforcing the maritime regime, uh, Turkey took steps in line with the expectations. When it comes to the uh, sanctions, uh, the airspace ban, so on and so forth, probably Turkey would still uh, continue to deviate, which is mainly related to uh, Turkey's unique concerns and sensitivities in this case. But here, uh, from an academic point, as someone who's trying to also understand why and how the Turkish uh, policy is shaping, because I am not part of the decision-making mechanisms, I see that a major concern from a Turkish point of view is this new strategic environment. Uh, how it will uh, unfold. This is occupying to a large extent the minds of Turkish decision makers. 
because as was mentioned very commonly in academic analysis as was also made clear in the plenary session uh, uh, by the diplomatic representatives the reason why we ended up here was the failure of deterrence uh, collectively the western transatlantic community failed to devise proper deterrent strategies as i just mentioned there are different reasons uh, for why we ended up here why we failed but now that there is this uh, euphoria about countering and punishing uh, russia uh, the jury from my own point of view is still out whether we will be in a position to devise the right strategies when it comes to uh, challenging confronting containing punishing i don't know the strategy what will be the strategy russia so for turkey as i see from an academic point of view again this concern is uh, very much out there so in this new coming phase the western transatlantic or international reactions to countering this new phase of the russian revisionism uh, will be a main concern of turkish decision makers and probably as was mentioned before by the turkish ambassador uh, uh, in audience uh, earlier uh, turkey is one of the uh, motivations of turkey as was always the case in previous uh, crises not to be stuck in between uh, different sides especially uh, not to come to a scenario where turkey would find itself in a kind of direct confrontation with russia that's why this sensitive uh, cautious approach will continue and therefore personally as well in this german marshall uh, fund piece yesterday i argued that this is what i see is happening in the turkish uh, expert community despite all the uh, counter balancing of russia along with other uh, western actors turkey still uh, will need to seek to maintain some sort of a constructive dialogue uh, with russia would need to uh, keep the bridges with russia and i think what's happening with the airspace thing and also maybe uh, some of the economics and uh, stuff uh, is just one indication of the way uh, turkey would seek to uh, devise its own response to this new phase of russia because uh, i'm gonna finish with this last point uh, whatever the outcome uh, of this uh, war on Ukraine, uh, whether Russia reaches its objectives, uh, what are those objectives? Still, there is strategic ambiguity, uh, total surrender, uh, establishing some sort of uh, vassal state, whatever we don't know. But even if Russia reaches it, uh, it will come out of this uh, crisis in a very weak, fragile way and managing uh, this uh, fragile russia will be a big challenge to everybody and i see that the turkish uh, policy is very much concerned about uh, maintaining the same uh, delicate constructive relationship with russia to avoid the negative uh, reactions repercussions of this new strategic environment in the years to come and this is where i will uh, stop and if there are further questions i will be happy to uh, join the conversation and my greetings to everybody on the webinar in different parts of uh, the world as well as those in tbilisi thank you thank you very much um, now georgi but we are almost running out As brief as I can. Uh, first of all, um, of course, we should talk about what to do now uh, and about the strategy for the future. But it would be futile if we just briefly didn't mention how we got there. And I will quote a person whom I, who I consider a good friend and uh, who is one of the most respected analysts. Um, 
And his words in 2014, when we saw Russians roll into, into Crimea, and where one of the reasons why Western strategy of pacifying Russia failed is that we've been listening to those who prove to be consistently and regularly wrong and did not listen to those who were uh, vindicated time and time again. I think now those who were wrong and those decision makers need to find some humility in themselves, need to reach out to those who have been warning the West, including people like Ed Lucas, who is still available and whose wisdom actually would be very, very useful in devising the response and the strategy for the future. Now, um, where we are at the moment, uh, okay, one of the arguments behind not doing even more, although I agree with everyone who didn't even expect the, this level of support to Ukraine, whether economic or even especially military, um, we are all very much impressed. Thanks God uh, it's, it's not 2008 all over again. However, is it enough? And I, I'm quite certain it is not. One of the arguments of not imposing the no-fly zone is that NATO doesn't want to get into direct confrontation with Russia. The problem with that argument is that Russia, Russia considers NATO in direct confrontation already. Uh, by the way, no-fly zone by no means uh, gives Russia a pretext, or especially a reason, to uh, consider nuclear response. If Russia wanted to resort to nukes, well, they could do it without the West kind of ele uh, elevating their response to any degree. Um, Putin has been playing a madman game for a certain time, whether he's completely um, saying nobody can really vouch for him, um, but we should not necessarily judge his state of mind by condemning Russian people to economic misery, because this is, has never been a priority for Russian rulers in history, ever. In 1762, uh, French charge d'affaires uh, Laurent Berger wrote to Paris that Russia is a unique country, if you consider it European. He said their rulers have the huge advantage by having these obedient people used to servile uh, slavery. Uh, and this is why they will always have their wars uh, coming at cheaper price than anyone else. And this nation will conquer, he said. And we've seen that many times. And at this stage, we can observe what the West saw in uh, 1940s. Right? After being allies in the World War II, unexpectedly for some, but with very clear logic, Soviet Union engaged in hostile activities, and basically in a new war against the West. It took George Cannon to explain why this confrontation was inevitable despite attempts, unilateral attempts by the United States, to pacify Stalin. Many, many blamed in the West themselves that we spooked Stalin, uh, we did not make it very clear that we did not have hostile intentions, this and everything that we've been hearing for years. So, since we are short of time, we are in the new Cold War, about which I personally, and this is, yes, everyone hates I told you so. And uh, since I cannot waive my interviews and my articles, you are welcome to visit GFSIS website, opinion papers, find Georgi Badridzes, the Russian imperial ideologies, or the sources of Russian misconduct. There was, there was everything um, that I had to say about this. The new Cold War, finally acknowledged by the majority, I hope, in the West, requires the new containment policy. 
helping hand to every democratic nation that is under the Russian aggression today. And like you said, Piotr, I completely agree, it's another matter how to punish Russia. And again, despite the fact that I'm impressed how strong the reaction was, we should not be under the illusion that this will bring Russia down in the nearest future. They are used to completely low uh, standard of life. This is not how you affect Russian regime. Okay? You have to go after the wealth of the hidden wealth, we dis discussed this, of Russian oligarchs, of Putin himself. Even that is not enough. The nations under the Russian aggression need help today, right away. Uh, and then, of course, we, need, we may discuss the long-term uh, policy of containment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, yeah, we have, I think, time for a couple of questions. So please. In years uh, of Cold War, we've seen many undemocratic countries uh, involved in NATO and European Union in uh, case to save them from Russian Soviet invasion. Um, as uh, Mr. McGeorgie said, that uh, Georgia, that new Cold War is started, may we see a new era of expansionism from European Union, from NATO, uh, even though many countries like Georgia, like uh, Moldova, like Ukraine, are not so great at democratic principles and so on and so forth. May we see them, as Georgia, as other countries, joined um, as soon as possible to save them from, uh, this time not Soviet, but Russian invasion. Thank you. Any other question? Nino Gelashvili, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. That's for our new uh, new guests. Uh, my question is: uh, uh, I have no answer on this question, and uh, I will be interested to hear from you before uh, the twenty fourth of February. Almost every day, actually every day, uh, uh, the most actively the U.S. government uh, was informing uh, the world that uh, Kremlin is going to invade Ukraine and uh, like declassifying their intelligence information. Uh, now everybody in the world uh, wonders whether Kremlin will use a uh, nuclear weapon where the Kremlin would confront or cross the NATO border, but there are no uh, those kind of declassified intelligence information uh, published. Why the West stopped uh, using this, I don't know, tactic? Because those are two questions that everybody uh, tries to find answers now. And of course, the most important is what is the force that could Prevent it. Thank you. Prevent using nuclear weapons? Preve yeah, stop Russia in general. Oh, yeah, okay. weapons stop and Russia cross okay. from crossing okay. NATO, from using weapon, of course. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, who wants to pick up? Okay, um, on, on the matter of uh, expansion of uh, EU and NATO. First of all, um, something that Russia has been expansion, it was in reality desperate dash, desperate run of Central and Eastern European nations into the safety. Uh, it was not uh, ideologically or geopolitically motivated uh, strategy uh, devised somewhere in the corridors of White House or uh, Brussels. This needs to be understood, and, and many people in the West uh, get it wrong, number one. 
uh, every single member that joined NATO uh, had to fulfill various criteria and only were allowed to join after. No one has ever dragged anyone into NATO. Membership in the European Union is even more complex. Even if today the European Parliament has considered a recommendation on the candidate status for Ukraine, and it is motivated clearly by geopolitical developments, Ukraine will never be able to join actually the EU based on geopolitics. It will have to fulfill very strong criteria. NATO may be slightly different. And this is where my recommend, uh, recommendation comes in. Regardless when and how this crisis end, ends, the first thing that the West needs to do before they start talking to Putin's successor, and this may happen much sooner than anyone thinks, before any new talks, admit Georgia and Ukraine to NATO, admit Sweden, Finland, and Moldova, three neutral countries, if they ask, if they decide, if they wish so, and then to talk to Russia. Because history has clearly shown that regardless of its political formation, regardless of the name of its political system, the empire, Soviet Union, or Eurasian, Russia, whatever, there is a boundary of Europe that needs to be protected. And one of the reasons why Ukraine needs to be protected despite the lack of obligation on part of the NATO members is that Ukraine may not be a NATO member today, but it is the front line of democracy today. Defend European democracy in Ukraine today unless you want to do it further inside Europe tomorrow. Uh, Intel, well, uh, we don't know whether they actually have clear understanding of uh, Putin's state of mind. Many people think that Russian military is simply without whom Putin won't be able to launch actual missiles. That Russian military probably won't let him because what they have seen clearly is not in line with the Russian national interest. Thank you, Georgi. And, um I guess uh, if uh, uh, our speaker yeah, says on, the on, on the nuclear question, I mean, of course, this is an issue of uh, deterrence, and nuclear deterrence is even more delicate, more <laughs> difficult than the uh, conventional uh, deterrence. I mean, as we have seen, uh, some Russian officials hinted at nuclear mobilization, and the best way to react to it is to uh, send clear signals, especially by the United States. And in recent days, we have seen uh, establishment of uh, communication channels to ensure deconflicting. I guess as part of such a dialogue uh, with Russia, uh, I mean, there should be clear warnings about the uh, nuclear uh, option. Uh, there should be clear warning about potential uh, response, and I am sure uh, such a dialogue is happening. I mean, as we have mentioned, uh, at the root of the current crisis was a failure of deterrence, and failure of nuclear deterrence would be uh, quite uh, tragic, and I am sure uh, this is being discussed, and this should be clearly communicated that there would be a proper response. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I guess this. Co hmm? Yes, uh, Andreas, would you like to say some final final words before we? Yeah, I, I, maybe I've mentioned that already. I can't, I can't remember because I've now been writing stuff. There, there's a lot of fear of this sort of World War Three, and the question is, you know, why? Uh, Again, I'm, I'm mentioning this this example of Nairobi. Why has um, why has Putin so far only been active in Moldova, in Ukraine, in Georgia, in Syria? Why has he never even tried to sort of seriously challenge uh, um, a NATO country? Why why did uh, NATO and Ukraine not go to war after Turkey shot down? Um, 
a Russian fighter plane? Why did the uh, relations between Turkey and, and Russia actually recovered after Turkey shot down a, a, a Russian uh, fighter plane? So I think, um, you know, this whole discussion about the um, World War III is a, psy uh, um, it's a psychological operation. It's just to scare us all, you know, you know, we shouldn't, we should take, we should think about Ukraine and not about some sort of hypothetical World War III. There were, there were the last 80 years, no, no World War, or the last, last 75 years, no World War III, and there will be no World War III because it's, you know, it's not in the Russian interest to have World War III, to put it in, in very sort of simple terms. And, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't, you know, get into this, uh, uh, into this psychological operation and, and sort of repeat uh, um, the, all these scary stories that, uh, that are coming out of the Kremlin. We should uh, think about practical steps to implement um, new ideas and to be creative, uh, how we can, um, you know, transform our sympathy and solidarity into actual material help. Uh, and not merely a sort of symbolical um, or humanitarian help. Thank you very much. Uh, and let me thank speakers for their uh, excellent uh, presentations. And thank you very much to the audience. Uh, I'm sorry that we had to talk on such an unhappy occasion, but uh, let's wish our Ukrainian friends victory. And um, thank you very much.